So I just wanted to say um, good morning. My name's Michaela. I'm one of the founding directors of an organization called Flourish Together. Um, we're a social enterprise, pay it forward consultancy and network um, supporting all sorts of things. And um, I personally have been supporting the um, university sector um, alongside Peter, who's co-hosting this with me from Cambio um, for quite some time. And we're really thrilled to, to have this event on today where we've got a range of um, sessions and we'll, we'll run through that shortly. Um, today's event forms the last session uh, in a series of four peer learning events where we brought a range of universities together to reconnect following on from the Unlimited Sea Change programme that we, Peter and I were both part of, funded through Hefke back in the day. Um, really pleased to have Ed, um, who's obviously moved on in his role now, um, joining this session, along with various other colleagues who have been part of that work, people who haven't been part of that work, to um, get involved in us thinking about, you know, the new landscapes that we have, um, you know, how different social entrepreneurs are still breaking boundaries and how colleagues in higher education institutions are doing that too and supporting social um, innovators, entrepreneurs and leaders um, where they're based and beyond. So um, I, I've obviously said a bit of a welcome, but it's just to, to reiterate, um, really pleased to have everybody here. What we're going to do, rather than do a kind of round robin of who's who, because that will eat into time, um, we have circulated a, a, a draft list of who, who the attendees are today, and um, we're going to update that as well. So we would ask if people can put their name, their role, and the organisation they're linked to in the chat. It'll help you spot who's who, who you might want to be chatting away with and connecting with um, alongside the event here um, and we'll make sure that we circulate those details as well as part of our updated list um, hopefully that's okay for people if you'd like to remain remain anonymous you can try but um, it's certainly um it's certainly going to be an interactive event today so um we will um, try and keep to time with it all so the purpose of today really, as I said, it's a culmination of a series of peer learning events and what, what we're trying to do today is join a few dots, bring both the university world, the staff student graduate social entrepreneur world, a whole range of supporters and other interested parties together um, as a kind of small but um, perfectly formed um, event um, where we're getting to hear from um, uh, social entrepreneur supporters, as we've said, um, and Peter's going to be chairing a panel on on that in a moment um, going to be considering you know different assets future opportunities uh, the lay of the land currently um, and think about gaps and future needs and the whole point really is to help us to consider what next steps we might take to be able to collaborate and um, there's, there's Peter and I have been working with um, universities for a long while now both um, you know, in a consultancy capacity beyond the Sea Change programme as part of different networks. Um, and as you'll come to hear today through the panels that we've got, there are, there are lots of different sorts of camps, if you will, that have formed. When we, when we ran the Sea Change programme uh, with Unlimited and backed by um, the Hefke investment, significant investment there, we, um, it felt like quite a united front, really, and I guess with the way the landscape shifted and just as a matter of course, different institutions have taken their social enterprise support or social innovation support in different ways. Um, certain things have changed over time, different um, networks and clusters have formed, and um, we're really keen as part of this conversations today to just be exploring what's, what's still out there, who's involved, and um, how do we um, collaborate together as a kind of strength in numbers approach um, going forward. So um, I think in the main, that's probably enough from me for now. Um, I'm just having a look down our participant list, just to check that we've not yet, just seeing who's arrived. And um, so welcome to those who just um, arrived a little bit later. We've just been doing a quick welcome and hello and explaining that we're not um, going to do a, a round robin. We'll get to hear who's who as we go through the panel discussions and conversations. But um, I've just given a bit of a backstory to, to how this event's come about. Um, we're just putting up uh, the agenda here. I'm not expecting you to kind of read this in detail. It's more of a prompt for us and to let you know that the day's chunked into, or the morning rather, is chunked into three sections really. We've got an opening panel with Peter in a moment um, with um, a series of supporters and people who've got um, 
I guess, a, a bird's eye view on a number of things across um, social enterprise landscape um, and in, in and beyond universities. Um, we're then going to have some breakout conversations, mainly led by our university partners um, on a couple of topics that we've been talking about uh, for some time. Um, we've kind of, over the last three or four sessions that we've had with the universities we've been working with, really trying to tease out what's a hot topic for people, what's of critical importance, what might be some of the areas or angles that we can cluster around, um, either to um, look at support for social entrepreneurs, look at connecting universities, or look at where budgets might align to um, you know, further, uh, further this agenda. Um, so we've got some breakout <laughs> shortly, um, and then uh, the, the last main session, uh, we're really pleased to have, and a number of them have joined us already, um, uh, um, some live specimens, <laughs> uh, some of our favourites um, and people that we could scoop up. But I'll tell you more about, about um, you know, exciting things across the social enterprise landscape with um, different social entrepreneurs from the graduate staff um, and student communities. But the last panel is all about them and reconnecting us and reminding us why we do this and perhaps, you know, introduce us or reintroduce us back to some social entrepreneurs who have been going for some time now. Do you imagine that investment, uh, you know, nearly about eight million pounds of investment from Hefke through the series of sea change programs that we ran, we supported over 2,000, if not 3,000 by the end of it, um, social entrepreneurs. And it's great to see so many of them still running. And we're really pleased to have a bunch of those with us later to uh, give us a warts and all experience um, and insights. And then we'll just wrap up towards the end of the session, just thinking about some initial areas for next steps. Obviously, three hours is going to you know, roll by um, and um, we're intending to have a kind of follow up session with our university groups to kind of distill and plan um, some stuff ready for next year. So that's the overview of what's happening. I think I've just seen Mariama land, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I will invite Mariama to come and say hello in a second. Um, I've obviously started off this welcome. Um, and I think you've heard enough from me, but it would be lovely to hear um, from one of our university partners. Basically, uh, we've had a handful of universities form a cluster who wanted to learn from one another, connect to like minded um, institutions and explore the possibilities for supporting more social innovators, entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, and we've asked Mariama to just perhaps say a few words from her point of view, um, because she's connected to all the networks out there. Um, and um, can appreciate, um, I guess, the perspectives across different networks that she's involved in. So did you want to say a quick hello, Mariana, from representing our university groups? Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry I joined a little late. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm Mariama. I'm the Social Enterprise Programme Manager at CU Social Enterprise. So we're Coventry University. Um, and we, are, we formed as a spin-out back in 2016. And when I joined the team, actually, uh, we'd already engaged with the Sea Change program. I remember one of my first meet, you know, one of my first conferences was actually in Manchester, and uh, Michaela and Peter were, were talking there. And it's really inspirational just to see, um, you know, just the interest um, and also the camaraderie in the room as well. So it was a really great way to sort of welcome me into my new role. Um, but most of all, it really helped me to connect to other institutions and, and like Nicole, Nicola said, not like-minded people who have a similar outlook, but also more importantly, what they want to do is see those changes happen within the local communities that we work in and bring our institutions closer to the, you know, to the local, uh, to solve local problems, but also support entrepreneurs on their journey. Um, so, so fast forward a, a few years, we're still, hanging around, we're still definitely... Um, You're more than hanging around, Murray, are we? doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah, so, you know, we work very closely with Peter at the moment as well. Um, so we were actually launching a social uh, incubator through the EBM uh, programme that we've been funded. Uh, and that is actually helping to inform it, how inclusive entrepreneurship, how important it is, but also how, uh, you know, entrepreneurs should, from the minoritised um, uh, sort of backgrounds are uh, definitely making a difference but how they can be uh, you know supported better so we're working with three of our entrepreneurs from our, from our my friendly city program uh, which was sort of across the west midlands uh, a couple of years ago 
Um, but yeah, and we're also part of um, the uh, SE Mark network as well, uh, which is really great in terms of, you know, just figuring out what's going on out there and also collaborating in terms of funding, in terms of support and just having somebody who can, you know, to kind of bounce ideas off. Um, it's really, really useful to have colleagues that are going through similar things, but also making those changes locally as well. So it's great to be here today. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks, Maya. Um, and we've we've obviously we've asked what, um, one of our sort of colleagues to, to represent, um, but we've got colleagues here from MMU, University of Westminster, um, uh, Warwick University. And um, I think Darren, bless him, has had to step in for a colleague. Somebody's got COVID and it's, unfortunately Darren from Sheffield Helm is not going to be here, but I know he'll be listening back on catch up. Um, and um, the, the beauty of some of the, the colleagues that we've got in this peer group is they're very proactive. You know, we're, we're a bunch of doers, you know, which, um, which is great. And I think um, creating this space today will hopefully give us time to, as I say, reconnect, consider the landscape, consider the options, and hopefully think about, you know, practical steps that, you know, we can take in, what, in whatever role we have um, to, to progress support for social entrepreneurs and, and like, like you say, Maria, and make changes um, and make the impact in, in our various communities, be they place-based, you know, thematic or anything else. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Peter um, we'll hear from lots of our other, you know, university colleagues. Hopefully, they come armed with all sorts of questions um, and thoughts, both for our panels and for our um, breakouts that we'll that we'll have shortly. So, um, Peter, if I can hand over to you, and um, look forward to to hearing this this first pa panel session. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Patashka. I'm the director of uh, Cambio House of Social Change, as well as one of the Sea Change facilitators. And like Nicola, have been involved in this work for over a decade old, uh, now and uh, sort of actually these reunions um, make me feel a little old actually as we, as we go through this work but it is exciting to see how um, things have changed I'm particularly excited for the panel we've got coming up and also to hear from the social entrepreneurs who've been developing their businesses alongside university communities for many years um, so delighted obviously we only have a relatively short period of time but we do have a wonderful panel so I'm welcoming Ed Hughes from Research England, Nikki Dickens uh, representing a variety of networks, including Profit for Purpose and Aspect, Lucy Finlay, of course, from Social Enterprise Mark, and James Finney from Social Shifters. On the next two slides, we've got a more detailed breakdown of, of their biographies. Um, the panel's going to run slightly differently this time round, in that in a normal in-person setting, we'd give everybody a chance to introduce themselves, where they're from, their background. What we're going to do is actually flip it and go straight into conversation, actually. So I've asked each speaker to say a bit about what they do in a couple of minutes, but actually very much in relation to the topic, which is almost past, present and future. What's the context? What are the current trends? And where is the landscape going crucially for the future in this work? So I know each of the speakers have been primed to speak on those topics um, and we'll circulate the slideshow afterwards so you can read a bit more about the work they've been doing over a number of years. We're very lucky to have them with us this morning. So thank you to all of them for that. Um, I wanna go straight off to Ed Hughes to kick us off um, with a couple of minutes. Um, so Ed, over to you, please. Thank you and Peter, if it's all right, I'll share my screen because I've got a few slides which I can, we can, you can uh, you can see uh, shortly. So yeah. hold on. Just make you a co-host and then. Oh, you, you already can. Fantastic. Are you able to see those now? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, so uh, very quickly, just in case people don't know too much about Research England. Uh, we are part of UK Research and Innovation. You can see the other parts of UKRI here, uh, along with the research councils and Innovate UK, uh, the largest public funder of research uh, in the UK uh, and funded through uh, government. Our parent department is, is Bayes. Um, so, oh, you've gone on mute there, Ed, by accident. Thank I think. You. Oh, there All you right. go. I'm back. Um, so, I'll leave these with you, but um, I think that there's some really important context around uh, where UKRI is going strategically, which I think supports uh, a much more collaborative. Uh, and participatory approach to, to research that's focused on connectivity across different sectors, uh, recognises diversification of the research and innovation system 
uh, both in terms of the people who undertake research, the way that research is uh, funded and organized, and uh, the, the subjects of, of that research, um, and that engages uh, broadly uh, across uh, research communities uh, and the users of research. So I think there's a real, there's a real opportunity uh, for work in this area uh, to, to take advantage of, of that broader context that UKRI is moving towards and has done since Otley and Liza took over as CEO last year. Um, research England sits within that and uh, is the largest funder of the university research sector um, with about two billion pounds a year, most of which is formula driven uh, and unhypothecated. So universities have the opportunity to invest that uh, where they see fit. Um, but we're also uh, thinking very strategically with government about uh, how research funding is allocated. Um, and, and I think again, you know, there's, there's a narrative which you will all be familiar with uh, around place and leveling up, which I think will find uh, expression in, uh, in the research and innovation space and with, with funding levers uh, as we go through the next couple of years. Um, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that government is planning a, a leveling up white paper uh, and uh, we are certainly uh, thinking carefully about how those uh, broadly unhypothecated streams of funding, which are driven predominantly by the quality of research, uh, could be used to address uh, the challenges around levelling up and the need for investment to, to support uh, a spatial dimension uh, in, uh, in our allocations. Um, Finally, uh, I wanted to talk about some specific opportunities in terms of the, the future uh, that, that may be of interest. And again, I suppose this is tangential. You won't find the words social entrepreneur necessarily in the, the kind of key text around this. Uh, but I think it, it shows the, the scope for uh, addressing and framing some of these issues around uh, the co-production of research and participatory research. And uh, Research England has introduced uh, a one year, uh, six million pound uh, participatory research funding stream, which universities will be able to access uh, from probably December this year. Um, it's allocated formulaically uh, in proportion really to uh, the uh, QR allocations. Uh, but with a, a cap and a, a floor so that um, every institution that's in receipt of uh, QR funding uh, will receive uh, some funding through the participatory research funding stream. Um, and, and it recognises the, the additional work that's involved, but also the opportunity that's involved in uh, co-production of research with the users of research and the beneficiaries of research. Uh, and so much of the, uh, the work that I've seen of uh, social entrepreneurs in the, the higher education space has been connecting uh, research with addressing uh, real world problems, often in the local community uh, and, and with uh, local communities. And that, that kind of co-production model is really strongly embedded in uh, the way that, that many of you are working already. So I, I thought it was, and my interest really, in, I suppose, in coming today was just to be able to uh, flag this opportunity because it's a, a one year fund and it's new money. Your institutions may not yet have plans as to how to uh, invest this. Um, so there may be an opportunity to go and talk to your institutions uh, and university research leadership to, uh, to see how you might be able to, to take advantage of this. Um, uh, and, and the slides, there's, there's a little bit more about kind of what the, the focus of that work uh, might be. Um, and, uh, but it, it's very broadly, broadly defined. And at the end of the uh, academic year, we're going to be running some activity in Research England to try and bring together uh, those people who've used this uh, investment uh, to understand uh, a bit more about uh, how it's been used, how it's been deployed, and where we might take this work further. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to flag that to you uh, as, a, as a particular Research England opportunity. And just quickly in the context of uh, my wider role across UKRI, I just wanted to 
draw your attention to some investments that UKRI's public engagement team have already made around citizen science with a number of uh, university partnerships uh, over the last few years. And the link is there. I can pop it into the chat as well uh, so that you can go and have a look at the projects that have been supported. And whilst I don't know that there's going to be another round of that uh, investment at the moment, it may well be worth having a, a look at those projects if you're not familiar with them uh, and seeing where you can connect with that work, but also uh, think about where we might scope out further work in the future. So, uh, so I've tried to focus a bit on the, the kind of present and future. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, although I'm a historian by background, I, I've avoided the temptation to look too much at the past. I'm um, very happy to talk about that, that later. I also should just by closing, just apologize. I'm gonna to have to drop off this call uh, at about half past 10 to go to another meeting. I'm hoping to come back to the uh, plenary session at the end. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry that I won't get to hear uh, how the, uh, the projects that uh, have uh, been going on in, uh, in universities and have spun out of universities over the last few years have, have progressed because uh, I, I'm really interested to catch up on that. So I'll look forward to hearing about that later. But uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk about those opportunities uh, that we have and um, very happy to pick stuff up in discussion later. Thank I'll you so much. Me. Thank you, Ed. That's super. It's really, it's really helpful to have the background in terms of both the funding environment, but also the political environment now. Um, so really good context setting to kick us off. I'm going to move then back to uh, the panel and Lucy, if you can jump in next. Thank you very much. And it's really nice to see some old familiar faces, not too old, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, uh, and, and friends as well, I would say, um, from over the years. Um, I was really pleased to see that I have been elevated to um, have a PhD apparently in my biography there. So um, thanks for that honorary doctorate as well that I seem to have acquired. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not I, I do have an MB, but I'm not a doctor yet. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. It must be a prediction. <laughs> Um, I'll take it take it for now. Um, so yeah, I'm, my name's Lucy Findlay and I run the Social Enterprise Mark CIC. I'm, I'm known to quite a few of you um, around the around, I'd say around the table, but around the virtual table of Zoom. Um, I've, I've uh, as well as running the Social Enterprise Mark, I've 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 grown quite. Um, uh, um, a, uh, a, a, an interest in the HEI sector and it's mainly flown from you know the relationship that we've had over the years um, with both the university sector um, and uh, especially with, with Ed um, who supported um, the work that we did uh, at a fairly early stage in, in embedding social enterprise into HEIs. I wanted to just talk a little bit this morning about putting this all kind of almost sort of raising it to a, a, a global context because I blog quite a lot about finance um, and I've talked to um, Nicola about women's social enterprise and diversity issues um, and all of this kind of gets me thinking a lot and perhaps lockdown has made me um, even more contemplative than, than I might have been um, before, but I think particularly now where we've um, just come out of COP26, um, whether or not it has or hasn't done um, any good, at least we've been thinking and putting climate change and wealth inequality at the forefront of our thinking. Um, and we know that um, climate change um, is changing our planet and the world's ecosystems potentially beyond repair. Um, and this is actually affecting the poorest um, and, and increasing the number and severity of national, uh, natural disasters. So um, if, you, if you listen to today's students, and I'm sure that we will hear more of this uh, later on, there is a real recognition that things need to change and we can't keep on with the same old behaviours and actions. Um, and when I talk to um, students, many of them are really wanting to look at a complete fundamental change in the way that we look 
at life and at business um, and want to put making a difference first. Uh, and I think that social enterprise really has a key role in this um, because obviously we don't put um, financial maximization first. We put the social um, and environmental value first. And that is a fundamental point about social enterprise. And I think why it's really quite an exciting time to be alive in the social enterprise world. Um, and, and as I've been listening to people over lockdown, I think we really do, uh, I increasingly think it's not just a niche thing, it's a fundamental change, a systems change that we need to um, be embracing. And I'd argue that HEIs are uniquely positioned to lead on this systems change work, and many of them already are. Um, however, if you look at a lot of the, the, the certainly the business courses, um, many of it is still kind of teaching this, the kind of the established thinking of, of GDP. And I know that there are a number of networks out there that are thinking slightly differently. And a lot of them are actually student led, um, as far as I can work out. Um, and so I think we need to just be thinking um, very, very differently about how we embed this sort of thinking um, across HEIs, um, both in the research world, but also in the teaching world and in, in our relationships um, with other um, businesses such as social enterprises. And I would argue that, you know, social enterprises should almost be leading some of the, the advisory um, councils on, um, on businesses, business courses. And I've, I've joined Solent University's um, business um, advisory council on this basis. Um, the other thing that we we have done obviously is run the social enterprise mark um, and in particular the social enterprise gold mark which helps to prove the embedded nature of social enterprise into HEI values at all levels. Um, so we examine and accredit the social enterprise credentials of those HEIs and that's been an important aspect um, to gaining the credibility uh, of work in this area. And we have our own um, HEI network, which I'll talk a little bit about and um, the future in a minute. Um, but we do kind of add um, existing, uh, you know, that, that has been linked to some of the work that's um, been going on in the knowledge exchange um, arena. Um, as well as, um, you know, some of the stuff around civic engagement. So it, it, this sort of social enterprise thinking and the nature of universities have a, a kind of a golden thread um, which links them very closely to social enterprises themselves, I would say. Um, so just to talk a little bit about our, our network, um, Peter's, uh, Peter, both Nicola and Peter have talked a bit about sea change network but uh, we've um, we, we come together every uh, couple of months to discuss good practice for those universities that hold our social enterprise mark and mariama talked a bit about kind of how that has run um, we've recently um, been having conversations with peter in particular about how we might come together um, more effectively uh, as joint networks, if you like, in order to be able to um, maximise um, our, our impact and, and our joined up thinking. And, and to this end, um, we're planning to have um, a joint face-to-face -face conference um, in, no, in, um, in February of this year. Um, we've already asked um, both Mariama um, and Andy from Westminster whether they would help us to steer this event because both of those universities sit on, um, on our network. So we felt that that, and they've said yes, because we, 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 we needed to um, make sure that we, we were um, talking to the right um, people and get the, the tone of that um, conference. But the idea of the conference would be both to network the two networks together, but also to talk to the wider social enterprise sector because it's been quite a while. I think probably the last sea change um, uh, formal conference where we've actually talked to the wider sector um, when Unlimited um, were in charge of um, that particular agenda. 
So we want to see more universities support social enterprise at all levels, but to embed social enterprise into their principles and the ways in which they work um, and to use our, our, our collective quite significant clout um, to plan for a uh, more flourishing and um, sustainable um, economy and society. Um, so I look forward to those of you that are able to, to come and meet us in February um, to actually meet us up. Now, I am, I'm going to be hanging around, um, hopefully for the rest of the conference. So I look forward to uh, participating and, and hearing what's being said. So thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak. Thank you, Dr. Findlay. Apologies for the biography mistake there, but in the right direction, I think we'll all agree. Um, thank you. And we'll certainly be saying more about that as the day goes on towards the closing plenary. So appreciate those those warm words, Lucy. Um, can we then move on to uh, Nikki Dickens next? Uh, hi, yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting me, uh, Peter and Michaela. Um, just to give a bit of a history of sort of where I came into this world and uh, like Nicola, uh and Peter, uh, I've been working with universities alongside them uh, on, on the CSAGE programme for more than a decade now as well. Uh, so, yeah, definitely involved in the past um, and, uh, uh, and the CSAGE um, programme was extremely successful. Um, during um, during the Sea Change programme, I extended to work more with um, social science researchers um, and academics who were looking to set up social enterprises and to spin them out of the university as independent um, organisations. Um, that sort of taking that to the present, um, I've been uh, doing some research on a, a very interesting programme, uh, which is called the Aspect programme. Uh, so the Aspect Programme uh, was launched by London School of Economics um, and now has 11 universities participating in the programme. And uh, the, the key aim of the Aspect Programme is to support social science researchers um, to commercialise their research. Um, so the programme has been, it's actually finished now, it was going for three, three years. Um, and they... Uh, Following, uh, following their impact report, um, I was asked by the University of Manchester, uh, working specifically with Martin Henry, um, to come in and look at how they can engage more social science researchers in the programme. Um, so I started on that research around right about six months ago, uh, as you can imagine, with um, with, with the uh, the lockdown and everything that's happened, it's been quite difficult to carry out uh, certainly primary research uh, and speaking to people. Uh, but I just wanted to share some of the findings from that research. Um, and it, 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 I totally agree with, with what Lucy and Ed have said in terms of uh, their needing to be changed. Um, we uh, we. We're looking at the journey, originally the journey that uh, social science researchers would go through uh, to, I suppose, commercialise the, uh, their research. And one of the key things that came out of, out of the, uh, the engagement that we did do was that exact word, commercialisation. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of the, the uh, researchers that came forward didn't connect with the word commercialization. Um, their, their response was we've, we've come up with concepts that we want to actually get out in the world and make a difference. Uh, our key drivers aren't about making profits. Uh, they're not about really uh, setting up a business that will make lots of money and then selling that on. Um, what we actually want to do uh, and the drivers is to, to, to make that difference and social change and to be able to do that sustainably um, and, um, and to, to, to scope and grow with that to make the original difference that we wanted to. Um, so I partnered with the University of Sheffield last year and we trialled a new approach with um, 
a, a program they were running, uh, which uh, is the White Rose uh, Doctoral Program. Um, again, that 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 uh, has MMU uh, working with that too, um, and we tried a totally different approach. Um, we had thirteen social science researchers who wanted to take their concept out there. Um, and we shifted it to actually looking at um, the key drivers of social change instead of the key drivers of commercialization, um, which really were, was effective um, in terms of the, the uh, researchers that came out and took their program forward. Uh, the interesting response um, from uh, the research uh, that we've carried out with the White Rose program as well was that many of the participants, uh, the um, entrepreneurs as such, didn't con connect themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, so again, the social thing was really, really big for them, but did not connect again with the entrepreneurship, with the uh, commercialization. And uh, for, for them, it was about, OK, we want to make this change, uh, but we're not sure whether we want to do that by setting up our own business. Uh, so it's all, also about, you know, how they can be social entrepreneurs within other sectors. So it might not necessarily be that they set up their own business. It might be that they go to work in the social enterprise sector and work in the public sector or the private sector. Um, so some really interesting things coming out from that. I mean, the research is continuing. The report will actually be out in December. Um, and as, as part of that report, we're actually looking at um, producing a typology of, um, of social science uh, researchers' journeys into um, getting their, their research out there sustainably. Um, and so for the future, so um, depending the report, the report coming out in December, uh, I have an exciting journey uh, starting in January as a social entrepreneur in residence at the University of Sheffield. Uh, so we can take this concept forward and start looking at different ways to engage uh, with social science researchers. Um, in how they actually take their work out there sustainably uh, and make the difference that they want to make. So, uh, so that's, that, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, so um, unfortunately, I have to go at half 11 today, but I'm really looking forward to the conversations uh, uh, with everyone else and looking at really how, you know, we can pull this all together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. And then last but by no means least, James Finney from Social Shifters. James, over to you. Good morning, Peter. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be with you today. Um, my name is James Finney. Um, I'm a senior uh, business advisor with an organisation called Community Enterprise in Scotland, CEIS. Um, we are the UK's largest social enterprise development agency based in Glasgow. Uh, we are also the founder of the, the Global Social Enterprise World Forum. Um, I come to you today to share my experience um, with a programme that we run in Scottish um, higher education institutions called Social Shifters. Um, and we do it um, in collaboration with ourselves at CEIS, um, the Social Enterprise Institute from Canada, and also Firstport, Scotland's startup agency for social entrepreneurs. So um, Social Shifters is the name of the programme um, that um, we deliver in 14 Scottish universities. Um, and that was launched a couple of years ago, um, perfect timing, just pre-COVID. Um, and then after a couple of months, uh, COVID came in, so we had to kind of pivot our way around that. Um, and really, the, the programme is designed, uh, sponsored by the Scottish Government, is designed um, to provide students with access to best-in-class digital learning resources for social enterprise, also with one-to-one -one business support, um, and also with access to funding from Firstport, um, really giving those um, students a pathway, no matter what stage they're at uh, in their development journey, uh, giving them the support they need, either through self-learning, 
through one-to-one -one or through funding to then launch the social enterprise. So that, that's that been a, a really interesting journey for us in the last couple of years, as I said, um, because of the, the COVID intervention. Um, but really starting to see a momentum building in that area and, and really uh, in line with, with the with the comments to date, um, because we're seeing student entrepreneurs who want to do business differently. Um, so we've now got a network of just over 500 student entrepreneurs in, in the Social Shutters program. Um, but as um, universities come back online um, and back into campus, we're starting to see further momentum build in that area. Um, what, I, what I can do, Peter, um, I've also wanted to maybe share and contrast the Social Shifters Programme in Sc the 14 Scottish institutions with our global social innovation challenge that we've also been um, involved with in the last four months as well. So if it's okay, Peter, what I'd like to do is maybe share some, some materials if that's okay, and just so give, people, yeah. give people a kind of flavour for that. So um, first of all, um, um, when I talk about the Social Shifters Programme, uh, at the core of that is our digital learning platform, Social Shifters. Um, I put in the, the link um, a little um, link for you to go and find out and explore what the Social Shifters platform does. Um, I won't take you through it, but I'll just give you a kind of flavour. We, we provide best-in-class um, digital learning resources, um, both at a micro learning level and also through our Steps to Startup um, incubator uh, programme, um, which is a bespoke social enterprise launchpad. And we also provide a whole range of inspirational content from a video, um, social enterprise documentaries, uh, social enterprise stories from around the world, and also um, um, details of partner programs uh, that happen um, around the world as well. We've got a cohort learning um, uh, um, approach to that. We've got Learn Dash functionality built in. You can track people's progress through that. So the social justice program um, is there to provide the platform but also the one-to-one -one support and also the funding. James, I'm just letting you know, I did make you a co-host. If there were some slides you quickly wanted to share, you're, you're very welcome to. Okay, you... Did, you, did you see my the, the, the screen I was sharing? I can't see it at the moment. Okay. You've clicked. Let me read. Let Please me read. share and find. Okay. Have a little look and see. Oh, there we go. Something's happening. Okay. Okay, so... Um, Basically, as I said, this is the, the social shifters platform um, where you can see access to a whole range of learning resources and um, digital learning resources and also inspirational video as well uh, that's in here. Um, it gives the students both micro learning resources and access to a digital launchpad program, as well as um, social enterprise stories and partner programs from around the world, as well as a cohort learning functionality. Um, and the ability to track people through that program. So this is the, the platform that's been utilised um, in 14 of the Scottish universities, allied to the one-to-one -one business support and allied to the funding support that we provide through Firstport. So, as I said, 14 universities, Social Shifters programme. Um, earlier this year also, we launched the Social Shifters Global Innovation Challenge, um, which, can you see that slide deck coming up now? Yes. Yeah. Um, the Social Innovation Challenge was the next, next step um, in our um, aim to, to basically take social entrepreneurship to as many um, um, young people around the world as we possibly can. Um, the Global Innovation Challenge was um, to mobilise young leaders between 18 to 30. Um, and what we basically um, it finished in October, uh, this is the first year of it. Uh, we managed to get about two and a half million impressions worldwide, about just under five and a half thousand teams participating from 141 countries. Um, and that led through to just over about 2,000 ideas coming through. Um, 54 finalists were selected and eight awards were made uh, in October. Um, with a kind of breakdown demographic, um, we saw 61% um, aged 18 to 24. 64% um, educated to degree level and 34% still within higher education and 49% of those participants from a marginalised or minority group. Uh, and, the, and the global winners uh, came um, from around the world, from Scotland to the UAE to Kenya, Mozambique, Jamaica, Canada, 
uh, you can see um, the fantastic young global social entrepreneurs really wanting to make a difference with 88% of the participants coming from developing nations. Um, so the, the innovation challenge really uh, aligned to the, the SDGs very strongly. And you can see um, how they, they corresponded to each of the 17 SDG areas. Um, so really within um, um, social shifters, we really have that, that remit um, and that ambition to, um, to basically support student entrepreneurs um, who have got a great idea and who want that support to take that journey um, initially in Scotland, but now we've got that aspiration to take it wider and uh, into the global um, environment and really start to, to help to kind of to drive that, 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 that momentum um, around the world. So I thought I'd keep it nice and short for you, Peter. Is that okay? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, James. And that's given us the time we need for, for questions. And um, we had some really interesting themes that came out. And I have one quick question that I really would like the participants um, at the conference to, to generate most of the questions. We heard initially about the levelling up agenda uh, and what that framework might look like for universities going forward. We also heard about this idea of a systems change and making a difference being a kind of golden thread to the work we're doing. And that fundamental impact needs to take a centre stage now and that I think Nikki came across really strongly from the work you were doing with aspects and then lastly James obviously some really helpful practical support in terms of case studies and potential online activity that can go with this so I think we've we've almost heard the whole package in about 25 minutes um, I want to quickly come back to you Ed as I know you need to leave my one question is around that leveling up agenda obviously that is the language we're using now over the past we've used language around big society before that it was a third sector um, and all of that has helped to move this agenda forward, whether we agree with the politics of it or not. So in terms of that agenda, Ed, what do you think some of the opportunities might be looking ahead? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll know more when we see the government's white paper. Um, I think from a, a higher education perspective, I think the, the challenge is going to be, and you, many of you will already have the networks which can help universities in this area, the challenge will be around building uh, local and regional partnerships and consortia to, uh, to address the, the challenges that uh, are, are found uh, and the regional disparities that, that we know exist. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, you know, kind of in the form of great slugs of money heading towards universities for universities to invest. I think it's a it, it's it, it, the, there may be opportunities to, you know, uh, for, for kind of funding to do things, but I think it's that's not likely to be channeled directly through universities. Uh, so I think it's about you know leveraging the the skills that universities have uh, and the partnerships that they they already have. You already have, uh, and um, the opportunities that those those afford to bring different uh, communities together. Uh, to understand uh, and and suggest solutions to, uh, to to the problems of inequality in in different parts of the UK. Thank you, Ed. Uh, could we get some questions from the floor then? Any questions for our panel? Feel free to raise your hand or drop them into the the chat box, whichever you prefer. It's hard on a Monday morning, isn't it? <laughs> questions, questions. And our panel are very welcome to ask questions of one another as well. <laughs> I, I'll maybe uh, I picked up in, in the, the information that Nikki shared earlier. Um, and, and Nikki would be talking about, you know, social researchers and and whether they then wanted to take that research and, and, and commercialise it. Um, one, one of the things that we're, we're doing in, in Scottish universities, as well as the work we're doing with students, we're also working with academic researchers and staff. Um, and one of the, the routes that we're going down because of, of the, that challenge is, is, is IP licensing. Um, yes. <laughs> So I, we, we're working with a, 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 an organ, a social enterprise in Scotland called the Challenges Group to really, if they don't want to take that forward themselves, then it's about how we can then help them to 
take their IP and license it to those who do, and and then they can still be involved at a, a governance level. But uh, it's it's a route that we are very much exploring. Yeah, I, I totally agree, James. It's um, something personally through the, the sea change program. I was involved a lot with with the universities that I worked with in terms of how to get around the the IP uh, and what we call transitioning uh, of uh, of the, some of these concepts and ideas that, that were coming through. And one one of the big challenges were that in many cases academics really didn't just want to become um, uh, an entrepreneur in that sense and leave everything behind. So one of the biggest gaps totally, and, and it'd be great to talk to you about that, James, is uh, the, the uh, support that is needed to be able to take uh, and, and bring some sort of infrastructure into these new social organisations that are fantastic. Uh, and are at huge risk of uh, of failing because they don't have that infrastructure support. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that's out there in actually getting uh, these concepts uh, uh, out and, and surviving and being sustainable in the future. So yeah, it would be good to, to catch up with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh Lucy, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was just going to reiterate something that I that um, supported that, uh, Nikki. Um, you know, I, I've noticed when I've gone out and and talked to um, various um, student bodies, like in Actus and others, that quite often um, the students are working in a bit of a vacuum, and it's not um, embedded with the local social enterprise infrastructure. And I try and engage them into that local social in enterprise infrastructure but it's not only that it's also the kind of um, national and international opportunities that are there so um for instance james was talking about you know the work that's that that that, that they've done to support um you know sort of international social entrepreneurs um you know we've started to connect um, with a Canadian organisation that supports women um, and invests in women um, specifically. And these are the sorts of opportunities that we need to be starting to plug um, these, um, these new businesses into to ensure that they do have sustainability. And it, there is a little bit, I think, a little bit of a disconnect at the moment between kind of what's going on you know, within the, the university setting versus kind of the whole of the, the social enterprise world. Perfect. Thank you, Lucy. We've actually now got three questions. So I'm going to go with Andy Norris first, please. Uh, morning, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I don't really use Zoom, so I couldn't I worked out how to raise my hand eventually. Um, yeah, it was just about the, um, the social shifters program, um, you know, whether there's any plans to extend that, you know, across the UK or, or you know, in terms of getting involved for, uh, I guess, English universities, what, what kind of is open in that aspect? Um, hi, Andy. Thanks for the question. Hi, James. Hi. Um, the, 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 the programme in Scotland is, has been um, backed by the Scottish Government. Um, I, I think uh, we initially did a lot of research. I, I met and went and met with about a dozen universities three or four years ago and really just wanted to, to find out how they were supporting student social entrepreneurship. And, and what I found was a real spectrum, um, you know, from those who had resources and, and, and ability to, to commit to that to those who were very light um, on that. Um, but a desire to do it. So that's when we, we put the programme in place. And, uh, and just like the Scottish Government is now supporting uh, the teaching of social entrepreneurship in all primary and secondary schools by 2024, um, mm. the, the decision was made that we need to go and, and also do likewise within universities and give a consistency of, of access to resources and learning um, you know, for those whether they had resources or not. So that was the basis of the of the, the program we're running in the Scottish institutions. But um, we are also partnering with um, universities in England as well. So Warwick are on the call today. Um, 
and also University of Oxford as well, and a number of others that we're speaking to. Um, so really, it's you know the the tools and the resources are there. Um, um, the the funding mechanism in Scotland is different from from what it is external um, across the UK, where it's kind of self funded. But the price points that we're talking about are you know low four figures. It's it's very we're trying to make it as accessible as possible. Um, as opposed to um, you know making uh, price points in there that are inaccessible for organisations. So our key remit is is really to reach as many and inspire as many student entrepreneurs as we can uh, in as in as cost effective a way for us and the organisations institutions, uh, so that we can just continue to to, to do that. Great. Thanks, James. Thank you. I'd like to jump to Andrew Baird. Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, it's more of a broad question, really, just about some of the issues that are raised there around how Coventry have, have used their own incubation space and, and set up as a social enterprise. And obviously, we'll hear from Halle soon about how the, we've attacked it at MMU. Um, but it's, it's also just about the joint of thinking about, you know, where does like the, the HEI's commitment to these social enterprises end? And That's a question on my panel, but yeah. Because... I'll jump the gun. <laughs> no, no, it's just... no, no, I was thinking, oh, we should ask that question now. So no, far away. Yeah, I'm just thinking around, you know, it's great to see uh, tools and resources provided um, and students always in the wider community lap that up. Um, but it's also just thinking about whether, whether or not how funding can be used and, and also the capacity of the universities. So they already have a lot of capabilities that can support social enterprise. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a way that either we could set um, universities up so they can support student student social enterprises with a form of guarantee so they could be the like community interest company with guarantee so that the university could essentially retain a, a, a stake in it to support it so it gets around some of those ip issues and the fact that the universities might be able to support them with um some of the capacity they've got in terms of expertise and also space like how they're using our uh, university premises and things it, it, it it's a, a model that I think it needs a bit more exploring uh, and a bit more commitment obviously from the university to, to have that longer term impact and uh, also I've got colleagues here from careers today as well and it's about how do we how do we continue that support and not just see it as um the education part of it but also if it's about our civic responsibilities how do we help continue the uh, give the give the social enterprise the best chance of succeeding basically it's a bit of a waffly point in question but take it as it is <laughs> and it's certainly one we'll come back to with our uh, entrepreneur panel shortly because I think they've probably got the best answer for, for, for some of that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great question, Andrew, and it leads in well, I think, to take the final question for the panel from Halle, please. We'll have our I break. Think, I think my question is very similar to to Andrew, but uh, I'm actually coming from a kind of a practitioner, uh, an academic. Uh, where do you think you know kind of social enterprise fits in within the curriculum? Because I actually had to take it extracurricular because I'm in the faculty of health and there was absolutely no way anyone was going to go beyond the, the sort of like the NHS models to kind of like break the, the mold and, and do it. And my experiences of the last, you know, kind of like, let's say 12 years of doing this is that, you know, it's very kind of it's, it's suitable for business schools. I know some other kind of schools are doing it really well at art and design and other things, but actually there's still some faculties that are really, you know, kind of, they, they don't really see the benefit and, and probably follows on from what Andrew said, how can we kind of widen this so that actually it becomes everyone's business and not faculty specific? It's a really good question, Hallo. And to be honest, it's in a way why Seed Change began over a decade ago, because we wanted to take out a lot of that really good practice in business schools and see it um, transposed across the entire institution. James, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I can only share the experience of what we've been doing in Scotland, and um, I think it's been uh, our our engagement with universities has been a, a gradual build up, um, initially through enterprise teams, then through careers, then um, um, basically speaking to academics um, who have got that um, spark, and then being introduced into their classrooms. So when you talk about healthcare, for example, you know, uh, Queen Margaret in Edinburgh, a fantastic university, 
who really engage in the social enterprise uh, agenda, you know, across the, the, the across the sphere. So I, I've given numerous talks from an academic teaching perspective to students who lecturers will just give me two hours at a time um, and say, just go run a session. So, for example, in healthcare, um, I run a two hour um, session on social enterprise and nursing, um, um, giving a huge range of practical worked examples from around the world that basically bring the concept to life. Um, so from my experience, it's very much a, a gradual build up, but um, it's just very ad hoc, isn't it, James? I know um, Peter and I and a number of colleagues of ours have been delivering in curriculum sessions from anything from architecture to health to leisure and tourism to arts and culture. We've got all the case studies and the toolkits and the stuff there ready to go. And um, it's, it's a case of how do you build a, a team of practitioners who can do this and how does it not be just one phone call with one lecturer in this ad hoc sporadic way is kind of how it tends to work i'm sorry to be rude but we're going to have to take a break otherwise we won't get one peter and i thought i'd just sorry to if people have still got questions or stuff to add and i think uh, jamie's points there you know there are lots of practitioners who've got um you know tools and resources ready to go in, in curriculum sessions and it's down to those more creative uh, lecturers or, or, or um, tutors who, who bring people in isn't it and their black book of who they can get a hold of so some of these things we can bring into the, the breakout conversations and we can certainly discuss more um, in the second panel. Um, I have set up our breakouts ready to go but I think we need to just take a good five minute break and I know a couple of people got to shoot off are ready to come back so are we all right to take our, our tea break there? Um, we'll come back, hold any questions for your breakouts or for the, um, the sessions later and absolutely put any further comments or any further reflections in the chat as people are starting to do as well. So um, if we come back here at, uh, we're a little bit over, let me just see, I meant to be 40. So if we say 45, if we say 10.45, we will get everybody back, we'll open our breakouts and you'll um, choose which one you want to join. Is that okay? Thanks so much to everybody who's spoken so far and look forward to continuing the conversations. James, did you want to just finish? You've got... Yeah, very, very briefly, um, I leave, need to leave at 11, but the, the Social Enterprise World Forum has got an academic forum um, tomorrow and Wednesday on um, social enterprise and academic learning. Um, I, I, I will put it in and distribute it to you. Um, there's three places for everyone here. Um, if you want to have a look at it, you can join and learn more about how academic learning is sharing about the concept of social enterprise. Fantastic. That, if you can put anything in the chat or anything you want us to share by email, we can do whichever way, James. And um, that's a great, great opportunity. So thanks. Fab. And it's a shame, James. I don't know if you've met Yvonne, who's here on the call, if you've got to leave. But Yvonne the Skipper is based at Glasgow. If you haven't met, you need to meet. <laughs> Oh, no, um, um, I like maybe do that via email, that'd be nice, thank you. Yeah, well definitely, you'll get all that, she's waving at you, so there you go, and it looks sunny, you lucky thing, sunny in Glasgow. Right, grab a cup of tea and we'll see you at four to two. <laughs> I'm just going to mute. So I'm just going to welcome people back, uh, we've, we've had some breakouts, we've been talking about um, incubation, in curriculum stuff um, and also uh, you know thinking about how we align and progress this notion of a civic university so lots of useful conversations happening we can uh, feed back on and evolve uh, later we're joined now by a range of people who are um, going to be part of the panel really we've heard from some of the supporters of uh, university stuff uh, be it uh, from a strategic point of view be it from um, um, you know, an evaluation point of view, be it from, from a network point of view in our first panel this morning. Um, this second panel that we've got coming up is hearing it from the social entrepreneurs themselves. And um, so we're really pleased. Uh, we've got a handful of, that have joined us because uh, we know how hard it is when everybody's so busy, let alone when people are trying to run businesses, um, how hard it is to kind of peel time out to be here. So we really appreciate uh, our panel who've, who've joined us. I was just going to take a step back um, before we get into conversation, just to kind of remind us of you know what we're talking about here. So when Peter and I and other colleagues, through the backing of um, Unlimited, who led the, the work, and um, Hefke at the time, who funded uh, the work, um, a lot of the universities, the 
90 or so universities we worked with to support social entrepreneurs, find, fund and support social entrepreneurs, invested in thousands of people. I think it was um, almost 2,000 people in the first and core wave of investment. And then when Peter and I and colleagues ran a consultancy programme uh, after funding had come to an end and we worked with a further 25 universities, we um, <coughs> realised that there were a good 3,000 people that we'd supported um across the across the landscape so this slide here is just a very quick where are they now um because um that's what we're going to be you know demonstrating with you with the panel that's coming up um i'm just going to highlight these in case you want to google them at your leisure but um green scene um, a kind of learning and education organization that came out of um nottingham trent they're their largest life um online and you can uh, follow up with them um the next one along is from um uh, they're called Gravity Sketch, and um, I remember meeting them back in the day. So it's always great to see when they um, are still still there and, and um, working uh, away and growing. More importantly, from the Royal College of Arts, um, Broken Spoke uh, were Oxford based, and they're a cooperative that's all about um, bike cooperatives and maintenance and training and getting more people on their bikes. Um, see the signs won one of our awards, and um, that was an app. And um, that was all about helping people spot uh, cancer and get an early diagnosis on cancer. And they're still uh, doing fantastic. Uh, we've got Farm um, Urban based in Liverpool. I remember working with them and going to look at the, this kind of um, hydroponic system and farming that they were doing on the students' union. Um, and that's just grown and grown. Um, COV, Creative Optimistic Vision, um, uh, led by a lady, a former student um, at Coventry, um, still doing all sorts around um, protective behaviours, supporting young people who might be at risk of abuse and other things. Um, Shiverpool, gosh, that's a real blast from the past, but um, I remember supporting them there um, when they were students, looking at how uh, to help more students get into work in the creative and sort of dramatic and cultural industries. And, um, they, they, they're a multi-award winning organisation that just kind of heritage tours and ghost walks and brings it to life through drama. Um, NV, they're uh, an organisation based out of Coventry again, formed um, when uh, they had the Commonwealth Games and um, still doing all sorts in terms of um, events organising. Uh, volunteer management um, and different kinds of activities. Um, too good to go. It's a shame. I was hoping to get Jamie on the call here again. Somebody who won um, a, an award from us. Um, I love it because I see there. I see them everywhere I go. Um, too good to go. I've gone um, national. Um, it's a way of stopping food going into landfill. There's some great videos out there. He got funded as a student to get that going, and it's gone. Um, certainly gone national. Naturally, they're based out of. Um, Denmark, I believe, so certainly across Europe in terms of finding homes for um, food that would have otherwise gone to waste at the end of the day, mainly through takeaways in various other places, uh, restaurants and that kind of thing. And then um, the books down there, Optimal Path Consulting, um, help to do with education. They were up in the northeast um, and they do all sorts of learning and development programs and particularly um, boosting um, environmental, not environmental, educational outcomes um, in, in the developing world as well. So just to give you a flavour of some of the amazing, sort of in, in this case, student-led ventures in Maine and that they're all still, uh, or many of them are alive and kicking. And um, just to reiterate, years ago, we through Sea Change, we did lots of toolkits, booklets and case studies. And this particular one, this Sea Change Makers one, is where I got my inspiration to think, oh, where are they now? And it was great to see across the staff and student ventures that are in here, 30 or so, um, well over two thirds are still, still going strong. Um, so testament to, uh, you know, how social enterprises really do um, build resilience, build their um, viability and, and make that change. So wetting our appetite there of um, organisations um, you know, out in the world there. We'll now bring it to our panel here who we've got joining us today. So I'm really pleased uh, to say we've got a mixture of um, staff, um, student graduates, and then uh, students turned staff. So there's a real mixture um, of people uh, we're gonna hear from in a second. Um, as Peter did before, I'm just flagging up. I hope I've picked photos that you're happy with people. I had to kind of <laughs> rush these slides together, but um, 
We've got Halle Moravej um, from um, Manchester Met um, University, as it says, senior lecturer um, in nutritional sciences there, um, you know, award-winning entrepreneur um, who set up a um, multi a kind of serial social entrepreneur. She set up Met Munch as a student-led um, organization and has kind of evolved a, a second organization, the Grow Meat Free, Meat Free Vegan Cafe, which is based in the atrium of, of, of Manchester Met's business school. Uh, we've got a lady called Tilly Harris, who's joined us, um, originally um, uh, studied um, photojournalism at um, University of the Arts London, but um, has now gone on to develop um, an innovative business um, that's all about connecting communities, um, I guess, cross-sector relationships, really, to help develop um, places and spaces and bring people together um, to, to do just that. And um, they have all sorts of consultancy services, amongst other things there that we'll come to hear about, all in the name of creating, you know, positive impact and um, using social innovation to create change. And um, uh, I think... I hope I've got my doctor right here. This might be where Peter, you know, got his wrong before. Um, where um, we've got Dr. Um, Yvonne Skipper. Um, she, we first met Yvonne when she was at the University of Kiel as a Sea Change Staff Award winner. And um, she's developed um, something called Whitewater Writers, which is where uh, different groups of people, um, children and young people, people in prisons, various groups, you know, the whole spectrum of people. Um, use creative writing as a way to explore themes, as a way to um, put novels or other, um, you know, types of books together. And um, they create these within a week. And uh, she's no doubt going to show us all sorts of examples of that. But um, uh, fantastic um, venture uh, that she co-founded um, alongside being a senior lecturer in um, psychology uh, now up in Glasgow. And last but not least, um, Dr. Craig Thomas. Um, we first uh, met Craig when he was studying, I think he was a postgraduate student, um, and um, him and colleagues in and around Manchester um, wanted to use their sort of collective knowledge of both sort of science, technology, um, and various other things to make the world a better place um, with a real grassroots community led feel to create this um, STEAM Hubs and Pubs, as it's now called, and their sort of flagship um, uh, pub um, or hub in a pub um, is called the Old Abbey Tap House, um, which has been going uh, for a number of years now and, you know, rode the, the wave of the pandemic and has done some amazing community outreach services, food, um, um, uh, TV dinners for sort of older people, they call this project TV dinners and various other radio stations that um, evolve out, out of um, the, the, the venue that they've got there. So real mixed bag of, of people, geographies and um, businesses that have been developed there. What, what we were going to do rather than have people talk about their story and their sort of journey, so to speak, is to, oh, sorry, is to... Um, kick off some questions really um, and just get under the skin of how how you've gone about breaking uh, sort of boundaries as you have and, and and what perhaps made conditions right for you to be doing what you're doing alongside the university so I might come to each of you if I may um, and just ask you know what what made what made good conditions for you in enabling you to develop a social venture you know whilst linked to a university um, It'd be great to just hear, you know, what's what made those conditions right? Because I think we sometimes forget we've alluded, Lucy alluded to universities being good allies in this space, but it'd be great to just hear from yourselves what made those conditions right. I don't know if Halle wants to kick off first. Sorry, well, can you repeat the question again? The question was, you know, what made what made for good conditions to enable you to develop Met Munch and Grow Cafe? I know there's been lots of challenges along the way, and we'll come to that, but um, what makes universities good allies, I guess, for social entrepreneurs in, the, in there? I think universities are like little ecosystems and they've got, um, you know, kind of in, in, in the case of Manchester Metropolitan University, we've got 38,000 students. That's practical. If, if, I, if I even kind of like get about 2% of those students interested in, social entrepreneurship or, you know, kind of, I, I don't know, kind of dealing with the impact of our work, then I think I, I've been kind of like, I, I will be happy. Um, but also there are a lot of very inspirational people with very unique set of skills. And I think as entrepreneurs, we all know that we tap into these kind of mini ecosystems. And I think, you know, kind of, I've always found that 
kind of my colleagues in the business school, you know, kind of the inner space, um, you know, school of art to, to provide us with design and inspiration, uh, you know, to, to be really fantastic part of the, the kind of support system because traditional support systems of university don't really work for social entrepreneurs. So you have to kind of like create this alternative kind of systems and dots that you have to connect. And, and I think universities are perfect for that um, because again, the nature of universities is that there are places of knowledge um, and research and innovation. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, I always consider university being in the middle of Google. You know, you, you don't have to type anything to find, you know, kind of, you, you know, there, there is someone real kind of at the end of the phone or email or, you know, Teams now. So, you know, for me, it's always, you know, I've always been excited to, to kind of like do what I do within the university with all its challenges, because universities are amazing places of, you know, energy. And I think that energy kind of inspires me. So, you know, kind of, yeah, I, I think for me, I don't think I can, I can think of any other place I would do what I've done uh, because it was needed and it was the right timing with the right people. Fantastic. Thanks, Halle. Um, I might come to um, Yvonne next, just for a couple of staff perspectives before we, we come to, to students. Yvonne, what, what made conditions good for you to develop Whitewater Writers? Yeah, I totally agree with what Halle has been saying as well. You know, it's being in a, in a place where there's lots of students who are keen to get experience. It's in a place where the university is keen to be reaching out and achieving impact, you know, whatever you want to, <laughs> however you want to define that. Um, it's being in a place where, you know, I think with, with me, Whitewash Writers, because it is, I mean, it, it's, um, it's a literacy project, but it's also aspiration raising and it's also um, a method for us to explore, you know, young people's views. So we've recently had a bunch of books on COP and climate change and things like that. So for me, as a staff member, it kind of sits quite nicely in kind of research, impact, outreach, you know, so it kind of does all these different jobs. And I think that was a really nice thing for me that allowed me to, you know, to, to spend some time doing this to build those community networks. And that's what's helped it to really grow. And I think, it did, am I right in thinking that you built uh, the organisation with a co-founder outside of the university? I think Craig's in that boat as well, where you've, um, when you set up Whitewater Writers, it was you and Joe and was he, was he in university sort of community? No, Joe, Joe was outside of university, so he was already running a charity at that point. Um, so that, again, was nice because it's the, um, the two different sides, I guess, you know, um, you know, working with a, someone who works in a charity as well. So I think, um, you know, for me these you know we've talked about this like we're the doers right but it's hard to be a doer we're all very busy and trying to balance things so having good partners and people who really do believe in it and who are willing to to push and to, to try new things and to just go yeah let's just see what happens um I think that's something that's that's really helped us to grow we'll perhaps come back to that see what Craig's perspective is and I kind of mentioned that because I remember working with Brighton University where they have this thing called COP um community university partnership something or other and it was a way of helping co community groups and organizations find the front door and find the right research partners or the right uh, academics to be able to work with in different ways so um something to look up think about there tilly um i don't think we've met before but thank you so much for, for joining us today i know you and your co-founder um alex um have set up um, um aku and, and, and you've done that um as, a, as students and obviously graduates and beyond now, uh, that was probably feels like some time ago, but um, I guess to hear from yourself, what as a student, what made good conditions for you, do you think, in being able to develop what you've done? Um, so originally um, I studied photojournalism at UAL, at London College of Communications. And I think I was really lucky in that way because everything about that course was about being a freelancer. And we had all these kind of freelance photojournalists and journalists coming in and just hammering it into us about how much we need to hustle when we step outside these doors. And I, I think that really embedded something into me and Alex about um, how adaptable you need to be and how you need to have a few different kind of plates spinning at once and that definitely helped us set us up um, for being not just entrepreneurs but social entrepreneurs at a time when you'd say oh social entrepreneurship to people and they'd go what's that 
you know now it's amazing to see that this is something you can actually have proper discussions in the past couple of years like it's completely shifted um so i think that's really important and also the getting the grant from the sea change thing was that's just king as i say <laughs> yeah it's it, well and also just having someone say yeah i believe in you you know in that way and then being partnered up with um peter and having um the exhibition that we had which was in a shop like a the frontage of the holborn ual site mm -hmm. and um yeah it just felt like there was a lot of push from UAL to find different ways of like not just in the university but what's your pathway out of the university and their alumni support has been really amazing as well. Interesting. Fab. Well people might have questions for you around that shortly but I'll just come to Craig. Um, thanks again for, for, for dialing and joining us today Craig. I'm sure you've got a busy busy lunchtime happening um, but um, what's what's made good conditions for you i guess um you know you're some of it's down you know in listening to this is the conditions that we're talking about in the university but there's also your own individual characteristics that i think have really been able to push through and join the dots and find what you need to find but craig from from your point of view what what's made good conditions to help you develop steam hubs and pubs and other things that you 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 do thanks nikita um can you hear me okay first of all yeah yeah great okay so i uh, thanks to the other speakers as well. I absolutely agree. The university is, is this big ecosystem. Um, and really, when you think about engaging with the university, you're probably just engaging with a small part of it. And um, from the outside, it can seem quite um, intimidating because of the size of it. And really not knowing um, how you can access the, the multiple resources that, that exist within these large institutions. Um, for me, I think one of the first things that was really helpful was that the university itself at Manchester, I'm sure the other ones as well, um, lists social responsibility as one of their um, key goals for, for the University of Manchester. It's one of their three core strategic goals. Um, and what we found is it, they're getting better now, but really they have this as a goal, but they don't really know quite how to um, affect that goal. Like they're doing things, but, but because it's so big, it's quite hard for them to realize um, the, the, the kind of social responsibility goals and so um, we've been able to fit in there in terms of um, being a, a space that they can invest in um, and also different funding pots that come up within um, social sciences school of environment education development which is where I am <clears throat> um, we can we can help with those because um, because we're next to the university and I'm in the university um, we can we can access those parts of money. Um, uh, another thing that's been really helpful is just engaging with the students because um, they're really there's so much potential there amongst these kind of hopeful young people. It's, it, it, in many ways, it's an untapped resource. And so um, we've at this. So so where where my Social enterprise is based, is, 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 is a pub. It's basically a pub next to the university called the Old Abbey Tap House. Um, and we've tried to set this up as a kind of experimental space where the students can come here and um, we, we write different projects that the students can do as part of their coursework at the university on the masters and for the undergraduates. And they come here and they'll do, uh, for example, uh, as part of a course called Governing Urban Transformations. Um, a few students did, uh, assessments on wrote reports on the feasibility of having beehives um, at our pub ultimately we didn't manage to get them at the pub but Bruntwood picked up the study and they've used that study to actually put in their first beehives on some of their properties in other parts of Manchester um, and then there's another one which that's developed into the university living lab which is uh, where businesses so if you're a business you can put down your project in there that you'd like a student a master student to do um, and then the students look through all these different ones, often from big consultancies like Arup or Bruntwood or ourselves, um, and then they'll select those and they'll do the reports working with the kind of businesses as well. And so we're trying to make it so that, you know, often people write an essay, they write it for the lecture, they put loads of effort into it, it's never seen again. Um, and this way we're trying to... Bring get, things to life a bit more and... Yeah, yeah basically make it so that actually doing experiential they feel it's learning useful. that they might not otherwise get. Yeah, and also outside the university, kind of social enterprises get to tap into that resource um, of all of these young 
energetic, imaginative people that have actually got time to, to invest in and, and to help us to um, with projects that maybe we don't have the time to do ourselves. Oh, interesting, actually, yeah. I think um, you've all talked about, you know, the universities as kind of ecosystem and a real sort of, you know, you're really tapping into different cross sector opportunities and influencing, using what you're doing to influence in, in so many different ways. Um, I just wonder, you know, whether there have been different inspiring characters that have helped you along your way in your journey, whether you can think of inspiring characters that have perhaps either helped you within or beyond the campus. Um, just just to help our colleagues in universities see who is it that, that, that social entrepreneurs and universities are, are, you know, who do they see as their sort of allies and champions, I guess, and who's helped them along that journey. Um, Halle, I know the, just a, a couple of examples, if, you, if you've got, if you can think of them. I'm sure there's been so many. <laughs> <laughs> is this a trick question? Shall I start with Nicola herself? No, no. Um, actually, I have mm. to say, Nicola and Andrew, who, who is actually in the, um, you know, kind of today uh, attending this event, were actually probably the heroes in my in my journey because um, I I was running Metmunch for three or four years not really knowing where I was going with it there was absolutely no you know kind of there was no template at all and I I kept carrying my portfolio to all sorts of leadership meetings the student committee meetings and actually people just thought as in the you know kind of in the words of a pro vice chancellor I was a wacky woman. I now probably kind of like would change that narrative to creative, driven, <laughs> motivated. But anyway, we'll take Vaki for now. Um, and um, and actually, I think uh, when I had one meeting with Andrew, who was in another campus, uh, kind of quite far away from Manchester. I, I live in Sheffield, work in Manchester. And actually, it was just like enough to, to for him to introduce me to Nicola. And I think... They were at, the, at that moment uh, giving out some funding to social entrepreneurs and we've, um, we, we received 5,000 pounds, which was massive. It was probably about like 5 million today's money. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was actually somebody believing in you. It wasn't at all about the money. It was about somebody saying, this is credible. This is amazing. And I, I feel they created a bubble, a protection bubble where, you know, kind of the, the you know, the, the management or other people kind of like at that moment kind of maybe thought, oh, well, she's wait, you know, wasting her time. Uh, she should be teaching. This is not teaching, you know, so that prevented us from actually, you know, I don't know, being closed down or forced to be closed down. So I think I think it was it was the timing and as a scientist, I don't believe in faith or destiny or, you know, kind of, faith, you know, all of those things that maybe, I don't know, we should. And, and actually, I have to say more and more, I actually think I've met the right people at the right time in my journey. And the doors have kind of opened and they are unusual doors. I always consider my journey as a bit like... Um, you know, a hobbit journey, going up a mountain with this, you know, ring uh, of social entrepreneurship that's kind of like burning into my my hand, but I'm not going to let it go. Although I don't want to lose it, you know, in some kind of, um, I don't know, um, you know, in Mordor or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, and, and actually I'm, I'm somewhere in between a hobbit and Harry Potter, for those of you who know. <laughs> So it's kind of like it's the magic, but I'm like hidden under the stairs. But at the same time, you know, kind of I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So, yeah, they're, they're, you know, have there's been, been... Halle, have there been um, any particular agencies or people who, as you've grown, because I've been talking about the start of the journey, as, as you've grown and think, you know, that you've got Met Munch has been running for a good few years now and has been winning awards. Grow Cafe um, has opened, had its challenges through COVID and then has reopened. Have there, have there been other, you know, often universities need to sort of think about how, where they signpost people to good support? Yeah, well, yeah. I think uh, obviously, uh, you know, kind of the, the external, entrep you know, kind of, again, enterprise uh, ecosystems outside are very useful. I mean, Manchester, you know, kind of voluntary sector has been really good. Um, other entrepreneurs within Manchester, you know, kind of because the food scene is amazing in Manchester and there's always something that people are doing. So it, it's been great. But actually other social entrepreneurs and Abby, you know, Tap House, you know, kind of we got Rachel who attended um, some of our training that 
we, we are doing with Europe uh, for a small project like ours. Now we are working with 16 European countries, 5.2 million pound project is extraordinary to kind of like be, you know, in, in, in this cohort of amazing kind of like uh, community, uh, social entrepreneurs. Um, and, it's, you know, and actually so the city, a met munch were both funded by you know, kind of hefty, and it was like a, you know, kind of uh, an unlimited actually. So both of us are doing projects with Europe. And it's been connecting with other peers yeah, uh, in your life. Absolutely. Connection. I mean, you know, you can always, to be honest, I, I consider myself at the bottom of the food chain at university. I never know what kind of funding has been received, who's doing what. And actually, again, I probably, you know, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I, 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 I don't have time for politics. I don't have time for kind of like second guessing because I just like doing, implementing, doing good business. And I think for me, there shouldn't be social enterprise and enterprise and I don't know, various layers of it. I think we should just do good business and business for good. So I'm interested in that. So, and I have to say as a woman, ethnic minority woman, a scientist, uh, you know, kind of a foreigner, I think uh, I've tapped into various um, communities like, um, you know, kind of social entrepreneurship for women, you know, kind of black ethnic minority, groups um, outside of university have been really, really useful. So, uh, you know, again, there are so many and leaders, actually, we've had some amazing leaders within university, the previous director of um, states, Mary Heaney, an amazing woman who actually said to me, um, yeah, when I started in leadership, I was the only woman in the room. And, you know, kind of she knew that I had spent my own money setting up MetMunch. So she assigned some, you know, kind of uh, operational money um, as part of my move to, to, the, to the facilities part of university. So I've got a split lots role. Of, lots of champions. Sort yeah, of lots of champions. Lots anyway, of I mean, my story is, is complicated and long, but well, yeah, I think- get yeah. a flavor of some of those, those, those characters along the way. And interesting to hear you describe yourself as a, a cross between the a Hobbit and Harry Potter. We'll, we'll, we'll explore that one another day. Tilly, um, I was going to come, come to yourself, if I may, from a sort of, um, you know, student perspective and um, you know setting up a venture beyond your studies and so on I'm curious who, have there been people either within or beyond your university who who sort of stand out as or, or agencies in particular that stand out as having been particularly helpful in, in your pathway um yeah definitely uh one is obviously on the call today with Peter's <laughs> Cambio um, has been very influential in our journey and um, Jonas Altman as well who was a um, he was on the judges board when we put our application in for the sea change money and he got in contact with me and just started kind of he just volunteered himself as my mentor and we've stayed in touch we're still in touch this day and he runs an agency called Social Fabric um, and he's been amazing as well. And the School for Social Entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I, I owe so much to them. Um, I was, I'm a fellow of theirs and I did the fellowship and the mentors I was given, one of them has ended up investing in our business. And they really, I always feel like I could message them at a drop of a hat, even though I was a, on the fellowship like in 2012, um, they're still, I still consider them like someone I could reach out to and they would help with advice or putting me in touch with someone. And then that's helped me build links with PwC as well, which has been really good for like such a small organization um, as ourselves. Um, so yeah, yeah I think- in there. So yeah. as much as you've got your ecosystem that a lot of people have described within the university, it's, you know, you, you've navigated your own way by the sounds of it through to different support and different champions have kind of, you know, seen, seen the potential and the, the talent there and wanted to get on board and support. Yeah, and I think like Jonas and Peter were definitely um, having connections with them at the beginning in uni taught me what it meant to have mentors and how to then reach out and make use of relationships like that. So that, that is also really, really important, I think. Fantastic. No, thanks, Tilly. Um, 
I was going to quickly ask the same from um, Yvonne and Craig in a second, and then we'll, we'll perhaps wrap up with that question that came about earlier around, you know, how long should a university play a role in supporting entrepreneurs and are they best placed to do so? We'll perhaps wrap up with that. Um, but um, Yvonne, I guess along your journey, we, we've just been talking about how, you know, as much as there's an ecosystem of great assets, resources, people and support within the university, are there, are there any key sort of champions or places that have been helpful for you that that it's mm -hmm. him. yeah thanks um yeah i totally agree um you know i've really appreciated um your support and i got some excellent support from kim billington badly um from unlimited as well mm -hmm. and i think that was particularly important for me and i now kind of pass it on because when i kind of first got involved in this sort of this sort of world um, it was quite new to me and i didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur because i'm like they just make loads of money and they're only interested in money and that's not me i'm not one of those type of people you know i didn't have that identity and it was over time of networking and meeting more people and going this isn't about money this is about people who want to make change um and of course the money is what helps you to keep making change of course so there needs to be a thought to that but you know it's interesting now that i'm able to share that experience with other people who are like oh, i'm not an entrepreneur you know people like me don't do things like this so i think that's been really important again that sort of mentorship and having people um and also that sort of idea of trust so i think i've been quite lucky um in time i'm i like talking and i think you know networks are really important i've met a lot of people um you know just in passing who've trusted you know it's quite an unusual process whitewater writers because we go into like a school or a prison we take people completely off timetable eight to ten of them and they're in a room with us all week you know they're missing their normal classes the normal lessons everything like that so there has to be quite a bit of trust in us you know that that process is going to work so you know i've been very lucky that people have trusted us let us have a go at it and through that we've been able to develop the process now to work with more than three thousand people um i think, so being, I think coming from a university is, has given you that kudos to to, to open those doors as well. I mean, sure, you know, you, yeah, I, think I, I, I say that because with lots of social entrepreneurs who aren't linked to a university and they may or may not find it hard to get whoever the head or the, the lead of some education organisation or a prison to, to let them through the front door. Just Yeah, I think sometimes that, that's definitely been the case because they've known me, you know, from university meetings. But sometimes I'm Joe, Joe laughs because I've got to meet people on trains and I like talking. <laughs> So sometimes it comes through that way, but I guess knowing, you know, you have that sort of clout behind you potentially, it makes you a little bit more trustworthy. So I guess that makes my job easier. And I've had, you know, students facilitating and volunteering and, you know, those sorts of things in the early stages as well, which I think really helped. So I totally agree with what Tilly was saying about like mentorship as well, you know, having people behind you who like believe in you, it makes it easier for you to kind of go forth or reading through your marketing stuff and, you know, all these sorts of things. That's definitely something that, um, the nitty gritty, yeah. isn't it? The nitty gritty of what of what you're doing there and getting getting good support and good feedback on that. Craig, I was just going to come to you, if I may. In terms, obviously, we've been talking here about who might be might have been useful champions and allies in terms of what you've been developing. Have there been any unusual suspects or anyone either within or beyond the universities that um, stand out for you as, as 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 being able to provide good support to help catalyze what you've been trying to do? Yeah, it would have to be you, of course. <laughs> really. Okay. Yeah, no, so definitely. You were, you were really important. Right, I mean, you were bid to get you. A, a you did write as a bid, <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously, oh, right. Rachel. I don't know if a few people know here know Rachel, my business partner. But you know, she's my kind of moral compass as well as <laughs> um, driving me forward. Especially if I'm not working hard enough or not on it. Um, outside of that, there's also Tecla. You know, Tecla and GMTV. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because um, she's right from the very start took an interest in the pub and. Um, when it used to be a limited company because Brentwood wouldn't let us set up a social enterprise, but she um, just took an interest and helped us to guide guide us in the right direction as we became a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. And then was very patient with us over years in putting together a, um, a loan from the GMCVO, which actually only came about during the last lockdown in December of last year. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, quite a useful time to finally get this loan. Uh, and another one within the university, Tony Lloyd, I'd say, um, early on. Do you remember Tony, Nicola? Um, he oh. ran UMIP. The university. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, they were the, so within the university, we went on a course on uh, setting up a social enterprise. And that's, I think that's where I met you, actually. Mm, absolutely. Um, and um, through that, we got some initial funding uh, of, Five thousand pound, I think, and five thousand pound of training as well. Um, but he was he was really helpful early on, just kind of 
getting us in the right path as well, I'd say. I think so. they're, still, they're still chipping away there. Um, um, and, and, and as you say, it sounds like we've had different kinds of allies. There's been people within the university, people who mm. are taking an interest right from that, whatever, incubator or support, people from within the kind of CVS or wider social enterprise support world where people have known how or where to plug into that stuff. And clearly your people's sort of business partners and, and mentors have, have been a, a, a key there. Um, we're almost at time with this, but I just wanted to come back on that um, conversation that we were having earlier around, you know, you know, how long should a university play a role in supporting an entrepreneur's journey and are they best placed to do so? And you might, you know, this is your sort of, uh, space for each of you just to, to give your reflections on this you know um you know uh, and maybe where they're you, they might be missing a trick in order for you know to catalyze support better so um i don't know we've been we've kind of gone in a a formulate way there so i might come back to Halle. <laughs> she's had time to think but um the, the question is how long should a university play a role in supporting an entrepreneur's journey and are they best placed to do so Are you there, Holly? Uh, well, um, I, I think actually, you know, personally, and I don't know what, what the, the, the fabulous group today thinks, I think uh, students get a much better deal and support from universities. We, you know, personally at Manchester Med, we've got an extraordinary career service. And actually, they've really stepped it up in the last two or three years, and they're doing it. I mean, great job. Um, and I, I've been working with them, and you know, kind of, we have an agency at university where we met much actually hires the students. And I'm always thinking about how to bring, you know, kind of new ideas and things like that. There is definitely, you know, a personally, I'm, I don't know if it is out there, but I don't I, like I, it, Hala. You're allowed. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I, I've not actually seen the support for lecturers who are entrepreneurial or, or social entrepreneurs or want to kind of like grow their circles. I actually really struggled during summer to find a mentor and I had to go outside of university to find a social enterprise mentor who would actually help me. Uh, you know, kind of grow in my own career, because I think, uh, you know, personally, I, I think if you want to be doing social enterprise within university, you probably have to forget about your own career progressing, because there is at this moment of time, there is no value attached to, to doing what I have done. I'm sure it will change and I'm sure it will change for others. But, um, you know, I, I, I always think, you know, kind of I wouldn't change it for the world because of the amazing, you know, kind of transformation that I've seen with the students uh, and universities. I don't think it's about the number I would put on this. I don't, I, I'm not gonna say 10 years, five years. I think support is different and it means different to different people. For me, support means that maybe, you know, kind of like, I don't have to feel as if I'm at the edge of a cliff. And, and, and every time that there is a change in leadership that I don't know, someone is gonna pull the rock from underneath me. I think for me, that, that means a lot more support than, than money or, you know, kind of like, I don't know, um, pizza or anything else. <laughs> and I, I, I definitely think we, this is time to change the way we do enterprise at universities. Let's get rid of pizza and let's bring some Greek food and some African food mm -hmm. and this plantain and other things, because actually, at, you know uh, what I've seen is that the the model hasn't changed and we've got the same speakers coming in and we're actually targeting the same kind of students I really want to kind of disrupt the way we deliver systems you know kind of these sessions at university so that it becomes more inclusive that we get people who never even thought about enterprise or entrepreneurship whenever I go to these meetings and boot camps they are changing but I think it's a slow so I want it to be a lot faster and a lot more you know kind of like driven by people who've done it and been there and got the t-shirt not by you know kind of not by people who maybe are doing a job but 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 you know kind of collaboratively with other people and I think well, I guess on that point Halle as well you know you've got a good pool to pull from in previous social enterprise people and mentors because of the stats there around you know um, higher numbers of people developing social ventures than, than private businesses and certainly the stats of the sea change program highlighted that, that you know there's always more which to do but highlighted good diversity in terms of, of yeah. who's coming through with that i'm just going to come because i know we're nearly at time of this panel um yvonne any thoughts from you around 
you know, this question of how long should a university play a role in supporting an entrepreneur's journey, staff, student or otherwise, and mm -hmm. are the best place to do so? Yeah, I was, I was thinking, um, just reflecting what Hannah's just been saying, I think I've been quite lucky because the, the project that I run is education based. It's based in psychology. Um, so for me, it was a, it wasn't such a big jump you know, from my other work. So actually I think I've been very lucky that I've been able to go, this is an outreach project, this is a research project, this is this, and that's allowed me to kind of package it within the role within the university. But I guess that's very different in terms of the perspectives other people might have, depending on the sorts of um, projects they're doing. So I think it's, you know, I totally agree. It's about the university recognizing this as being a valid use of staff time, you know, that it is impactful. You know, there's so much work at the moment in the universities about, you know, even with the ref, you know, are you impactful? Can you show you're impactful? And then when people are doing impactful work, they're like, yeah, but it's taking too long, like hurry up, do something quick, get a big grant in type thing. So I think it's the university really needs to recognize that, you know, this work that staff is doing is, is really valid. And as Craig was saying, you know, bringing in, um, you know, like, partnering students with on entrepreneurs as well uh, maybe that's another way of trying to increase that diversity that's something we've been doing as well to try and embed it in the curriculum so it doesn't sit over here but it's actually embedded within all the other things that we're doing so I don't think I've really answered your question there I'm aware we're right. excited, Tilly might have excited ideas, excited. I guess as a student <laughs> herself as well who's kind of spun out I wonder Tilly have you got a th any thoughts on this you know how long should a university you know support students in their enterprise journey and are they best placed to do so I'm just going to throw it out there. I, I reckon a decade, like 10, 10 years, and maybe that should be something that's like offered as an option. Like, do you want to have this? Do you want to be on the books in a way? For, I know you have the alumni thing, but I'm always confused about what that structure actually is. And maybe if it was like, you've got this 10 year because I know for us we really I think about it all the time about like I must get in touch with UAL and ask about hiring other photojournalists to come and do work with us and mm -hmm. stuff and and I have a block like I don't know where to start with that mm -hmm. and um so yeah I don't know I just think yeah if you if you had almost like a of time frame and said let's you know be your backup for 10 years and just you know where to go and who to speak to for this set period and that could be a really interesting thing for the universities to really track that journey out of uni track and the, then, track the journey track the difference yeah. but also have access to um, emerging and evolving entrepreneurs as well who um, can bring in additional expertise and real world you know, learning as well as uh, different contacts and connections. Um, last but not least, Craig, have you got any thoughts on this question before we start to either take any burning questions from the, the room or um, head into the sort of plenary? So any thoughts? Um, yeah, I think um, just agreeing with the other speakers, there's a bit of a, uh, a separation between the job you've got at university and the social enterprise work, as in the university does not recognise in any shape or form anything that you do in your social enterprise. So they don't, with me anyway. If I had, was applying for another job in university, it would be based on my teaching experience, the papers I haven't published, but the papers I should publish. And, uh, and they'd look at that. And if I put anything about this in, um, I don't think it, it would really go that far. And yet, weirdly, everybody in the department knows that I'm doing this. They all really appreciate it. They invest, you know, get everyone to come down to the pub. If there's any funding that might help it, they point it in my direction. But it just doesn't fit in with their criteria. And I think probably something should change in the future so that it's not so kind of how many papers you've published. Yeah, yeah I totally, totally agree with you, Craig. Honestly, I think we need to, to meet up to see how we can change this narrative because, you know, whenever there is any promotion, jobs or anything like that, you're not actually considered at all because, yeah. you know, kind of what you you've kind done. Of a round peg in a square hole and we perhaps need to see how we change the shapes of some of those things. And, you know, all, I'm yeah. really passionate about supporting staff in universities. It's one of my sort of things because I can see the students do get a lot of support. And um, that said, there's a lot more to do. And there's these, I don't think the two things have to be mutually exclusive, particularly when it comes to social entrepreneurship anyway. In lots of cases, you get staff don't take this the wrong way, Tilly, I'm sure you, that don't want to mingle with students and don't want this, that, you know, it's, you know, and then, but actually social entrepreneurs just want to make their, their ventures happen. And um, I haven't seen that um, barrier, if you will, where, and, you know, 
um, so, uh, social entrepreneurial um, academics or staff haven't wanted to get in a room with 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 students and talk things out and flash things through where that might be different in on other topics so um, well it's been I hope that's been a, a helpful conversation to sort of tease a bunch of things out there I'm just gonna come off screen share for a second just in case has anybody's got any burning questions I know we've got five or ten minutes before we we wrap up but has anybody got anything was you really wanted to check, ask, throw out there? Um, yeah, yeah. Can I just add something? Yeah. You, know, okay. you know, we we definitely nobody took us seriously until we set up Grow Cafe, which was about making money uh, in a, in a nice social, you know, kind of amazing way with the students, and that was in two thousand and nineteen. And we we raised, uh, you know, prop. I mean, what was it like? We added, you know, kind of what was it? I, it was like a coffee shop that wasn't making any money whatsoever. So we took over that, and you know, kind of by the by the close of business, just before lockdown, we have in, we had increased profits by two hundred and seventy four percent. And I think that was the moment. And I think, unfortunately, we went into lockdown. That I think things changed for us because people realized. We can hire a students, we can do good work, we can make health and well-being commercial, and this is kind of like, this is something really good. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, if, if whatever you're doing, maybe it needs to kind of like actually showcase an element of commercialization. And, you know, someone just said it takes 10 years. We've just reached our 10 year anniversary. Maybe it is that moment where things change. Yeah, there's certainly a sort of three, there's a kind of three, five and 10 year milestones, aren't they? And it's a case of, you know, having honest conversations with the universities about what role they want to play in that journey and, and what's what the pros and cons are for everybody um, taking people and, and being part of things. And nobody's really talked about how, you know, how do you get your university to actually then buy your services or partner with you or, you know, but that's just one for another day. Um, fabulous. Well, if people have got additional questions, by all means, put them in the chat and we can try and come back to those or our, our panel can kind of respond. But Peter, I'm conscious we're slightly over time and we need a good few minutes to just um, have our plenary session and, and welcome back to Ed, who sort of caught the tail end of that bit there. We've been having some useful breakouts and obviously our, our speaker panel, uh, second speaker panel there. Um, oops, I'm just going to come back to the slide that we need, Peter, and then we're nearly ready for wrapping up and getting lunch and moving on to the afternoon what everyone is doing so peter um i know we so were Keller. yeah i mean we have a couple of things we want to update on don't we but i think before we do that it'd be great to hear if there are particular closing comments from the group um perhaps off the back of the final panel conversation but really across the whole day mm. if there are any sort of cool reflections around things that have stood out for you that are of particular interest that you want to explore further or indeed a takeaway um, we, we've already positioned a number of possible follow-up sessions over the next few months. Is there something that you really want to to drive going forward? So, a good moment to perhaps open it up to um, members to either raise their hand or drop them into the chat box. I'm just gonna I'll just stop sharing for a second so we can see people. Anybody? Cool. People gone quiet. Um. I'm not a member of the group, or I don't know if I count as a member of the group, Peter, but um, something that came through quite strongly for me was um, the piece around leadership and getting their buy-in from the top. It's not, you know, a lot of us are grafting away sort of from the bottom up, um, and that's what social enterprises do. But actually, if we're talking about, you know, systems change, it needs to come from the top. Good point. Thank you, Lucy. Really good leadership. Yeah. Other takeaways. I don't. I don't know with Ed coming back. So I'll. I'll give a couple of takeaways from the session that we had. But um, thanks, Craig. Don't worry. Um, a takeaway for me, it was refreshing to hear that there is definitely an appetite for social enterprise specific stuff. I know it's not always done that way. It's not always easy to, to, to say that or people think, oh, it's too hard <laughs> to kind of peel this out as a thing. Um, and it can be counterproductive in a, in a wider sort of enterprise agenda. But certainly we were hearing that there's research from direct consultation with students at some of the universities where they're asking for specific stuff around social enterprise, social innovation and um, 
you know, making a difference, business for good type stuff. And a lot of the boot camps that, that are happening are seeing, um, you know, a need for community interest company and cooperative and other social enterprise form development, which isn't always um, done or, or looked at in the mainstream stuff. And that that's increasing all the time. Which So there's an encouraging sort of, you know, continued momentum for all of this stuff. And certainly there's a lot of knowledge, skill and talent in the people who are around the tables today um, in being able to create tools and resources. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, everybody needs something slightly different sometimes, but um, between what social shifters do, what Flourish do, Profit for Purpose, Cambio and the universities within this collective and no doubt across the work um, that Lucy's doing with her network, sifting out a kind of you know tools and resources to inspire support and grow um will will definitely um is something we can pull together you know can i just uh, you know kind of i don't know give my points um, mm -hmm. i think we need role models i think you can see what you can you, you can't do you can't be what you can't see so you know kind of at university you know kind of you know the, the female entrepreneurs especially need to see a lot more role models i think to me every time i think about entrepreneurship i think about alan sugar you know kind of uh, you know all the men in suit and actually the nature of business especially now with regards to you know kind of the sustainability the planet the you know, education for a sustainable development, all of that is changing. And yet we still see, as Lucy was talking about, this Dragon's Den approach. Dragon's Den is like practically dead. I think we definitely need to be doing something different. Um, and actually, you know, kind of allowing a students to solve problems of the world rather than kind of, I don't know, it's kind of just doing, you know, doing it for money. So role models are so important. I wish I had role models, but, you know, kind of that doesn't matter because I think we, you know, all of us could actually, you know, be mentors to the next generation and we definitely need to do it. Sure, absolutely. Any other key, key takeaways or thoughts before we set out some thoughts for some next steps? Mm -hmm. Brilliant point there, guys. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to pull the slides back up and we will absolutely take other, other takeaways and other points in the chat. Um, and um, I'll just flag that back up for you, Peter, just saying that we were almost at time to think about some looking to the future points. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, I think, three uh, key next steps, if I can call it that. And some of the takeaways and themes and discussions from today will feed into those. I think there's some really strong ones already. We've heard about role models and champions being really focused on impact for impact's sake rather than anything else. That's the key message that came out today. And leadership top down as well as bottom up. Um, and there are more. First of all, we will have a follow up conversation in December with uh, the universities and members of the group to have a conversation around how, how some of these key themes will translate into actual tangible collaborations. Um, and absolutely, we won't be having any more Dragon's Dens, Hala, don't worry. Uh, I don't think we have actually, so we, we've kept that, but um, yeah, so it's a point well made. Um, we'll send an email out, won't we, Peter? With a, we've got a couple of dates we in mind. We were just trying to keep yeah. things warm um, before the end of the year. Um, so we'll email our universities to see if they want to come back around the table and pin down some 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 additional next steps here. For, for we will certainly do that, yeah. And then in terms of going to 2022, uh, Lucy um, previewed it, um, I think, at the beginning of the session about this idea of how do we bring together a national network um, that incorporates things like Sea Change as it has been, Sea Change this year, um, Social Enterprise Mark, the work they do, and others who perhaps aren't in the room who'd be interested in engaging in this, um, with a, a sort of revamped version of the network going to next year. And we're hoping to hold an in-person event in February um, with the purpose of doing that. So some of these themes, again, will come up at that event. Um, we're not in a position to share a date as such yet, but we are hoping it will be in-person, or what we intend for it to be in-person, all being well. Uh, and we're meeting with a number of universities to, to look at the, the high level agenda for that and what the best timing and venue will be for that. So that will be coming up in February. I don't know, Lucy, if you wanted to add anything to that at this stage. Uh, no, not really. I, I think you've said it all there, Peter. It's very much work in progress. And I think the discussions that we've had today have been really helpful in um, drawing out some themes that perhaps we can follow up on. 
Perfect. Thank you, Lucy. And then also we've looked at this idea of a community for social entrepreneurs fitting into the last panel. Nikola, do you want to say more on that? Sure. I mean, it's something that I've, you know, I love working with universities. Don't get me wrong, but you, you can be very slow beasts. You don't always pay on time. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I like to get my hands dirty with the entrepreneurs directly. So um, that's what we do at Flourish. We've been supporting networks of social entrepreneurs for years. Um, and I do feel as though somehow the these amazing you know 2000 plus social ventures that, that have been supported and as i said you know when i've gone back through this change maker booklet and there's just 30 in there two thirds of those are all still running and i know how to get hold of them you know and in addition to that we've got a database of you know hundreds of others um not not forgetting all of the the social entrepreneurs that have been coming through since sea change over the last you know four or five years or whatever so I'm quite committed to trying to pull together a couple of conversations or a couple of social events um, online or offline to look at how we um, support more social entrepreneurs in the university communities as a, as a community of interest. Um, I'm, I'm well versed with both the, the student groups and student graduate groups as well as the staff groups and I think there's, there's something to explore in giving them a place and a home because you've all got such amazing entrepreneurs coming out of your institutions giving them somewhere to go to meet their peers in other areas to meet thematically um, or to just hear from people who like Hallie said role models people who've been there and done it whether they're staff students or graduates um, could could be a bit of a game changer um, if we get our act together with it so um, I'm happy to try and facilitate that if there are people who are interested we'll just see what we can get happening next year and I'm pleased to say I'll put it in the chat um, for anybody who's interested, we, we are purposefully using, I'm not using, showcasing um, social entrepreneurs um, at universities and um, in Manchester in particular, um, I'm running um, some um, events with um, Greater Manchester Social Enterprise Network where <clears throat> we're going to be at Grow Cafe on the 24th of November and inviting the broader Greater Manchester sort of um, social enterprise mafia <laughs> and everybody to come and learn more about how can we encourage more young people into social entrepreneurship um, and then next year we're going to milk and honey cafe that spun out of the university of manchester um, and also the old abbey tap house we're going to next spring as well to run events so just trying to create ways of highlighting these places and we're happy to see how we could perhaps do that in other areas as well as you know where we where i'm based in manchester so that's my that's my uh, offer <laughs> so they're the three key takeaways i think we are slightly over time so i'm conscious of that and, and believe we should wrap up now but are there any specific final takeaway comments or, or themes that we haven't picked up on that anybody wanted to drop in before we close Oops. I think we will take that as a no. Thank you so much then to everybody for your time this morning. We know that it's a big commitment to give up this and much time online or indeed offline at this point in the year. So thank you so much. We really look forward to sharing and disseminating the outcomes and of course the recording to colleagues that couldn't make it. Uh, and a special thank you to our panelists for the energy and ideas and enthusiasm that you shared throughout the day. Nikola, did you want to say a, a final few words as well? Just thanks for everybody's time and getting involved. And I know how hard it is to kind of peel hours out, let alone three in a row so um thanks so much for that i hope the conversations we've been picking up and running with here are, are of use to people that people are going to be able to uh, follow up with at least one or more connections from from conversations and um it's just it's just great to see so much um energy and interest in this you know movement still you know peter and i and colleagues from unlimited and ed with all his support and backing back in the day really did you know make a big big splash in terms of putting social entrepreneurship innovation and leadership on the agenda and, and it's fantastic to see it rippling out in all its guises be that through you know individuals be that through things like that this aspect network that, that nikki was looking at be it through uh, more of them getting involved with social enterprise marks so the more that we can sort of um, get behind these things and um, help more people the better really so we'll our commitment's still there into 2022 and we'll get back in touch with everybody ready for you know whatever's relevant for people fantastic well we will wish everybody well i'm going to um, stop recording <laughs>